welcome, Age of Vintage Society. Linda Ronstadt's voice was seemingly a gift from the angels above. It was one that enabled her to belt out country rockers like Heat Wave and yearning ballads like Blue Bayou with equal conviction, making her a top-selling female artist of the 1970s. It was also an instrument that provided the heft to branch into adventurous terrain, from a starring role in The Pirates of Penzance on Broadway to an immensely successful album of Spanish-language music. How Linda Ronstadt learned rock and roll from Maria Callas. Make sure to watch the video until the end and leave your thoughts in the comments. If you are new here, join our wonderful community by subscribing to the Age of Vintage channel. Linda Ronstadt is probably the most successful woman singer of the 70s. Cashbox named her the top female pop singer of the decade. She may be the most popular ever. Her concerts sell out within hours of being announced, and she has had four records go platinum. To many, Ronstadt epitomises not just the Southern California sound, but the 70s as well. Her music, as the decade, is random and eclectic. Ronstadt is an interpreter. Rarely does she write her own songs or play an instrument. She merely sings, and her voice, technically soprano, seems capable of anything. She has sung almost every form of music except perhaps hardcore disco, and succeeded. She reaches way back for standards such as Old Paint and I Never Will Marry, and sings them with innocence. She lunges ahead into the risky territory of punk and knocks out a haunting version of Elvis Costello's Allison. She belts out love songs like Loose Again and Down So Low, with the authority of someone who has seen and done it all. She sings Mexican, Motown, Reggae, and The Girl Can Sing Rock and Roll. And when she sings a country tune such as I Can't Help It, If I'm Still In Love With You, there is no doubt that Ronstadt has something for everyone. She was born in Tucson, one of four children, in 1946. Her English-Dutch-German mother, whose father invented such things as the electric stove, rubber ice trays, the grease gun, grew up in Michigan. Her Mexican-English-German father, who runs a successful hardware store, is from an old Arizona ranching family. At four, Ronstadt's father, who loved to sing, pronounced his daughter a soprano, and that was it. From that moment, Linda wanted to be a singer. She became addicted to the radio, memorising every song she heard. Music dominated her life. Growing up in Arizona in a musical family, Ronstad sang Mexican ranchera songs in four-part harmony with her parents and siblings while listening to old-time string, country and American jazz standards on the radio, and opera and classical music on her grandparents' vitrola. She said the music she heard in her parents' and grandparents' homes before she was ten provided all the material she needed for her entire career. There's a scene where her sister is playing piano in the family's Tucson home while her brother, the soprano, sings, I said I want to try that. My sister turned to my brother and said, Think we got a soprano here. I was about four. I remember thinking, I'm a singer. That's what I do. It was like I had become validated somehow, my existence affirmed. That affirmation would only increase on the path to becoming the most successful female singer of her generation. Early on, her singing style had been influenced by singers such as Lola Beltran and Edith Piaf. She has called their singing and rhythms more like Greek music. It's sort of like 6-8 time signature, very hard driving and very intense. She also drew influence from country singer Hank Williams. She has said that all girl singers eventually have to curtsy to Ella Fitzgerald and Billie Holiday. Of Maria Callas, Ronstad says, there's no one in her league, that's it, period. I learn more about singing rock and roll from listening to Maria Callas records than I ever would from listening to pop music for a month of Sundays. She's the greatest chick singer ever. She admires Callas for her musicianship and her attempts to push 20th century singing, particularly opera, back into the bel canto, natural style of singing. A self-described product of American radio of the 1950s and 60s, Ronstadt is a fan of its eclectic and diverse music programming. She attended Catholic schools and her penchant for flouting tradition, a trait she picked up from her maternal grandmother, surfaced early on. 
She teased the young priests, exasperated the nuns, and wore black pants under her white debutante dress when she made her formal bow to society. Ronstadt managed to stick it out for one semester at the University of Arizona before hitting the road in 1964. Her worried father slipped his daughter thirty dollars and told her never to let anyone take her picture without her clothes, probably the only advice Ronstadt has ever heeded. At age 14, she formed a folk trio with her brother Peter and sister Gretchen. The group played coffee houses, fraternity houses and other small venues, billing themselves as the Union City Ramblers and the Three Ronstats, and they even recorded themselves at a Tucson studio under the name The New Union Ramblers. Their repertoire included the music they grew up on, folk, country, bluegrass and Mexican. But increasingly, Ronstadt wanted to make a union of folk music and rock and roll, and in 1964, after a semester at Arizona State University, the 18-year-old decided to move to Los Angeles. She was always tough to figure out. Ronstadt, after all, is a singer whose career was defined by restlessness and genre hopping, a rock and roll sex symbol whose upper lip alone launched thousands of crushes, but who was always far smarter than ever her fans gave her credit for being. A perfectionist who knew what she wanted but had trouble believing she was good enough to give it, and a private woman in a public game. She wasn't easily summed up when she first came to Los Angeles more than five decades ago, and she isn't easily summed up now. After visiting Los Angeles in the mid-sixties, she was mesmerised by its emerging folk rock sound, and decided that's where she needed to be. She had her first hit, Different Drum, with the band The Stone Ponies, and it launched her solo career. In 1977, Time magazine dubbed her the Queen of Rock, a label she struggled with since she considered herself more of a country singer. She wanted to learn how to sing all the styles of music she had heard during her youth. She was one of the first performers who dabbled in different genres in a way that was both innocent and strong-willed not caring that record companies thought she was crazy. She hooked up with Bob Kimmel and Kenny Edwards and formed the Stone Ponies, which was basically a folk country band that played local gigs at places such as the Troubadour and the Palomino. The group eventually signed with Capitol Records and released three albums. The band had one hit, Different Drum. In 1969, Ronstadt struck out on her own and released her first solo album, Hand Sewn Homegrown. A second album, Silk Purse, was released in 1970 and included her first hit, Long Long Time. It also earned her first Grammy nomination. In 1971, she released her third solo album, Linda Ronstadt, and formed a new band which included Glenn Frey and Don Henley, who later formed a band of their own, The Eagles. In 1973, Don't Cry Now was released. By that time, Ronstadt had a cult following, pulling her fans not only from the country ranks, but from pop and rock as well. But it was in 1971, when she teamed up with Peter Asher, who became her manager and producer, that Ronstadt took off. She released Heart Like a Wheel. The single from that album, You're No Good, sprinted up the charts to number one. Her cover of Hank Williams' I Can't Help It, If I'm Still In Love With You, also from Heart Like a Wheel, won Ronstadt her first Grammy Award for Best Female Country Vocal. Prisoner in Disguise came next and was followed in 1976 by Hasten Down the Wind and Linda Ronstadt's Greatest Hits, and Ronstadt won another Grammy, this time for the Best Female Pop Vocal Performance. The Playboy Music Poll named her the top female singer in both pop and country categories. There was no stopping her. The next year she released Simple Dreams, which some critics still call her best work. The album produced five hit singles, including her all-time biggest single, Blue Bayou. Simple Dreams was also Ronstadt's best-selling album, over three and a half million copies in less than a year in the United States alone. And Playboy again named her the top female singer in both pop and country categories. Living in the USA hit the stores in 1978 with an initial shipment of more than two million copies. That album further demonstrated Ronstadt's versatility and growth. She sang the Hammerstein Romberg tune, When I Grow Too Old to Dream, covered Smokey Robinson's Ooh Baby Baby, Chuck Berry's Back in the USA, as well as Warren Zevon's Muhammad's Radio, and Elvis Costello's Allison. 
By that time she had appeared on the covers of many periodicals, from Red Book to Rolling Stone to Time. Her fans couldn't get enough information about her. Ronstadt has broken new ground and remains unpredictable. One minute she appears barefoot, the next she appears on roller skates, setting off a national craze. The next in Ralph Lauren boots. She wears a white silk dress to the bottom line and blue jeans to Nancy Kissinger's Carter inauguration party. She is rich. In 1978, she made an estimated $12 million. She is independent. She has talked openly of drugs, sex, love, men. She is rumoured to have bad romances with such men as J.D. Souther, Albert Brooks, Mick Jagger, Steve Martin, Bill Murray and, most recently, California Governor Jerry Brown. But by 2000, the ten-time Grammy winner knew that something was wrong with her once powerhouse vocals. I'd start to sing and then it would just clamp up. My voice would freeze. Ronstadt was officially diagnosed with Parkinson's disease in 2013, but she lost her singing voice four years earlier. It felt like something was wrong, but I couldn't tell what it was, she said, describing the initial symptoms. First I thought it was my headphone mix, then I thought it was the microphone, then I thought some frequencies were just missing from my voice. It got slowly, steadily worse. She struggled to make two albums as her voice worsened. Collaborators assured her there was nothing wrong, that the notoriously self-critical and perfectionist artist was simply feeling nerves. But their words rang hollow for someone who innately understood the singing ability that had been there from as long as she could remember. Forging ahead with what she called a limited palette, Ronstad gutted out another solo album, Humming to Myself and a collaboration with Anne Savoy, Adieu Fool's Heart. Filled with sadness, Ronstadt adjusted slowly to the loss of her instrument. In time, her mobility declined as well, but she grew exasperated with a voice that was now yelling as opposed to singing, and she delivered her final stage performance in November 2009. The sad thing is that she was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease a decade after her symptoms began. In fact, I couldn't sing for the last five or six years I appeared on stage, but I kept trying, she shared. I kept thinking, what if I tried singing upside down, or standing on my head, or while juggling? Maybe I'd be able to sing better then. So I don't know why I couldn't sing. All I knew was that it was muscular, or mechanical. Then when I was diagnosed with Parkinson's, I was finally given the reason, she added. I now understand that no one can sing with Parkinson's disease no matter how hard you try. Meanwhile, the physical problems worsened. Along with experiencing debilitating back pain, she found herself struggling to do mundane tasks like brushing her teeth. Dealing with the loss of touring revenue, Ronstad accepted an offer from Simon & Schuster to write a memoir, and she diligently set herself to the task, typing out her life story even as her fingers refused to fully cooperate. The shaky hands caught a friend's attention, and Ronstadt finally agreed to see a neurologist. I had a shoulder operation, so I thought that must be why my hands were shaking, Ronstadt said. Parkinson's is very hard to diagnose, so when I finally went to a neurologist and he said, oh, you have Parkinson's disease, I was completely shocked. I was totally surprised. I wouldn't have suspected that in a million billion years. She had been diagnosed with the disease and, as a result, can't sing a note anymore. She recently revealed that she has retired from performing. Don't expect a Streisand-style comeback. Parkinson's disease has left her unable to sing, but that isn't how she ends the book. In fact, she never mentions it. Ronstad wraps up the story by focusing on her family, how her two children both play instruments and have an active interest in music how her siblings, cousins and their children in Tucson still gather monthly to sing family songs, how they play professionally in various bands. You come away respecting someone who simply loved to sing and used her abundant natural gifts any way she could. Ronstadt may no longer be performing, but we have a huge and wonderful library of ways we will forever get to hear her remarkable voice. Though Ronstadt can no longer sing and struggles to get around, she hasn't lost complete connection to the talent that has guided her life since she was a teenager, says Ronstad. In my mind, in my imagination, I can still sing. 
If you liked this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you are new here, and if you want to support my work, please visit my Patreon page. Now it is your turn. What do you think about the life and legacy of Linda Ronstadt?